University of Groningen, distinguished guests and students, my dear friends and colleagues. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good afternoon and God bless everyone. On behalf of the School of Life Science and Technology, it is our greatest pleasure to welcome our special guest, Professor Robert Gullen. Thank you very much, sir, for sharing your precious time with us this afternoon. We really appreciate that. This afternoon, we will be listening to Professor Cullen's talk entitled, Does Internationalization Have a Role to Play in the Biomolecular Science? Professor Cullen, Biomolecular Science has become one of the central aspects in the school that, have, that we have dwelt in this issue for decades. Therefore, I would like to use this uh, opportunity to quickly introduce to you about our institution, just to stress few points that has been shown in the video. With over 1,500 students and 100 lectures, the School of Life Science and Technology runs 10 study programs in two separate campuses, in Ganesha, in Bandung City, and in, Jat in Jatinangor, Sumedang. This includes undergraduate programs in biology, microbiology, bioengineering, forestry engineering, agriculture engineering, and post-harvest technology, as well as three master programs in biology, biotechnology, biomanagement, and one doctoral program in biology. Our lecture are grouped into what we call expertise groups, ranging from molecular biology, microbial biotechnology, plant science and biotechnology, animal physiology and biomedics, agrotechnology, forestry technology, ecology, and management of bioresources. In summary, our school cover field from molecular to ecosystem level. The topic that will be delivered by Professor Cullen with the keyword internationalization and biomolecular is very important for us. On the wake of COVID, COVID pandemic, it is more obvious that the world is borderless. Apart from the problem created by COVID, I personally see more borderless world could open up to new opportunity, including opportunity for our graduate with biological molecular skill to get job outside Indonesia. Therefore, the insight that will be given by Professor Kulen on this issue will be important for us to better prepare our students to be more competitive in international arena. And if there is opportunity, they may wish to become citizen of the world with their skill in molecular biology. I also hope that this occasion become one of key moments for building more fruitful collaboration with our school in the future. Lastly, I wish everyone a very enjoyable lecture from Professor Cullen. And I do hope that all of us can learn a lot from this lecture with uh, uh, listening from his experiences and insight. And uh, before closing the remark, I would like also to thank Dr. Fanny Marta Duifani for arranging this meeting. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I end this remark. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, thank you very much for very informative and warm speech, Benda. Uh, then we will move to the next agenda, the guest lecture from Prof. Robert. I would like to invite Pak Indra to introduce introduce Prof. Robert to the audience and become a moderator for uh, for our discussion today. Uh, please, Pak Indra. Right, thank you very much, Bufeni. My voice is clear enough? Yes, very clear, Paindra, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. So um, it is my honor to moderate this uh, afternoon session in Indonesia and of course uh, morning session in, <laughs> in the Netherlands. So uh, thank you very much, Professor Dr. Robert Skullen for uh, coming to our uh, online webinar uh, at School of Life, Life Sciences and Technology. And before uh, I hand in the uh, lecture to uh, Professor Robert, let me uh, first uh, read the uh, curriculum vitae from uh, Pro Professor Robert. Uh, of course, he's a professor of uh, international 
Internationalization of Higher Education and HL Standard U UAS, uh, the Netherlands, and also now he's uh, the director of Center for Internationalization of Education, Campus Friesland, University of Groningen, and also team leader curriculum development, master education, and HL Standen, US um, University of Groningen, and also visiting professor is China Normal University, Shanghai, China. His research interests includes internationalization of higher education and also uh, management education uh, for the um, uh, scientific uh, research interests, of course, in virus diseases. His achievement is really uh, many, many here, uh, including the member of audit panel, Estonian Quality Agency for Higher and Vocational Education, and also associate edu uh, editor for Journal of International Students, members, Journal of Studies in International Education, Sage uh, Publication, and also many uh, jobs in as a reviewers in many journals, including in uh, higher education. So, uh, actually, not only maybe the the audience can uh, later ask about internationalization that uh, have a role to play in the biomolecular sciences, maybe from our academic staffs or uh, uh, or the uh, audience here can also ask about higher education, uh, especially during pandemic, because maybe you, we want to compare it between Indonesia and also in the Netherlands. For your information, actually, um, um, Professor Roberts uh, got uh, uh, infected by uh, COVID-19 last year, and he said that he uh, had a coma in more or less 23 days, right, uh, Professor Roberts? <laughs> Amazing. So, But now he's really healthy. He doesn't uh, didn't get any uh, side effect now from the uh, COVID-19 uh, diseases. So uh, we are really happy to have you here. And uh, of course, um, uh, we we pray for you that you can get uh, healthy or uh, stay healthy all the times. So without uh, further ado, I would like to hand in the um, floor for Professor Roberts. Uh, welcome and please, uh, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much for such an uh, extensive introduction. Um, let me um, share my screen, in particular the PowerPoint presentation I'm going to use. Share. Here we are. Um, I want to preface, uh, and I've listened to the introductions and your wishes, what you might like to learn from this lecture. So at the outset, I'm going to make it very clear that I'll be talking about two aspects, really. I'm talking about what internationalization could mean for uh, SITH. So at the, let's say, institutional level. But <clears throat> also, I'm going to talk about what it can mean for the individual level because institutions are nothing but collections of individuals. So uh, there's, of course, quite a bit of science in adding up what it does to individuals into what it does for a, a, a faculty or an institution. Um, but it'll hopefully uh, become clear as I uh, present my talk. Um, you did a very um, extensive um, introduction, but I'll just make it a little bit more personal. Um, I grew up in the Netherlands, finished high school in the Netherlands, and then decided that the world was just a bit bigger than this tiny pipsqueak country, and I should see some of it. So I left and went to study in Australia. Um, from studying came work, um, and I stayed for about 30 years in Australia. Um, the first part of my academic life, I was a molecular virologist, um, I then became a university executive, um, and now I uh, am a professor of internationalization of higher education, as you said, and a director of the Center for Internationalization of Education at the University of Groningen. 
Um, my background was in biology, and I peaked in terms of my biological career as a molecular virologist. The curious thing about my PhD, if two years ago I had said to someone what the topic of my PhD was here in the Netherlands, people would have blinked with their eyes and not really know uh, what I was talking about. But now when I tell you that uh, I got my PhD on the topic of the occurrence of variants during a virus transmission or a, an epidemic, everybody understands it. In fact, down to fine detail. Um, a paper I did with one of my PhD candidates at the time about um, reverse transcriptase PCR is still being cited uh, last year. And so something that's about uh, 40 years old. And I can talk about that because people understand PCR now. So how the world has changed. Um, I moved into university executive roles as director and vice president of various uh, universities. Um, and that was really out of, uh, uh, call it frustration. I moved from the University of Western Australia to James Cook University in Queensland. Um, funding that I used to achieve in Western Australia, where I kept a team of about 25 people going, uh, seemed to have a political tinge and disappeared. Um, and so when I was offered a senior executive role, I switched from research into managing universities. Um, when I moved to the Netherlands, initially at Leiden University as its vice president international, after a while, um, I changed jobs to uh, NHL Stenden University of Applied Sciences to be their vice president, and they have campuses around the world, and I was responsible for them. Mind you, when uh, NHL Standard decided to merge with its neighbor, I decided that was enough for me, and I wanted to go back to research. Let me tell you, um, my, my boss, the president, said, yeah, but we don't do molecular biology here, so what are you going to do? I said, well, I want to do research in internationalization of education. And I can honestly tell you that um, I was very concerned about me as a natural scientist starting to supervise PhDs in the social sciences. And after about eight years of this now, I can tell you the PhD process, the process of becoming an independent researcher is no different in the social sciences as it is in the natural sciences. It's just that tools for research are a bit different. And I feel quite confident now of supervising candidates in the social sciences. Why do I tell you all this? I'm gonna tell you all this because it's a bit odd. And, and, and I freely admit uh, when we are in meetings, um, Hey guys, I'm only a molecular virologist. You're all experienced in education. So if I say something silly, please uh, pull me on my shirt tails and tell me, cool, and you know, you're talking rubbish. But that hasn't happened. And it hasn't happened because what they tell me actually is, well, you see things differently from the way we do. And that enriches our conversation. And this, in essence, is my message to you, when you bring together very diverse group of people, very interesting things will happen and I will demonstrate that to you. So what, what can we learn from internationalization? Let me first make a very um, daring statement uh, and, and people who know me in the field of internationalization sometimes sort of raise their eyebrows. I often say when I give talks about internationalization that I think it is a pity that the word internationalization contains the word international. Now that may seem very odd, but I hope at the end of this talk, you'll understand why I said this. Um, when you're at great depth into a particular uh, piece of research, we run the danger of forgetting our surroundings. Now, fortunately, and I've looked um, at SITH research, you're not doing that. You always have an eye on 
what can my research mean for society at large? How um, can I, with what I'm doing now, make some progress so that society benefits? So there is a strong uh, application focus on the type of research you're doing, and I really like that. However, maybe the surroundings of doing the research could be expanded a little bit. And again, that's the basis of my, my talk. Let me first, as a scientist, I like to work with definitions. Um, in 2003, Jane Knight from Canada said, basically, you have to add an international or an intercultural or a global dimension to the functions of the university, teaching, research, and societal engagement, and you're internationalizing. Um, what that's done, and, and, and I'm referring back to my statement, it's a pity that the word international is in internationalization, is that universities around the world have been adding these international, intercultural, and global dimensions to the work they do and say, we're internationalizing. But you got to do this for a purpose. And so with two colleagues um, a few years ago, we took Jane Knight's definition and expanded it and said, do this to enhance the quality of teaching and research and provide benefits for all, including society. So we gave internationalization a focus. And a year later, I decided to zoom in on the learner and said, look, it's about gaining some learning outcomes, namely those of intercultural competence and international awareness. Intercultural competence, the ability to interact appropriately with individuals from a different culture. International awareness is a much broader concept. Uh, it's about um, being aware of how your local actions might have global implications, being aware that elsewhere in the globe, there may be other priorities, etc. It's a, it's a very, in a way, a very vague sort of concept, but you can take small parts of it and make that very specific. I have to mention this because um, during my time at Leiden University, I ran some conferences on global ranking, and I think they are an interesting exercise, but it shouldn't really define us. In any case, Nyang Kai Liu, when he started the uh, uh, Arwu, uh, it was an accident. He, he did this work on behalf of the Chinese government and thought, you know what, I'll just pop it on a website uh, just for interest's sake. Well, the storm of protest from rectors of universities who were not listed in his initial survey of let's see how China performs against the rest of the world. And that was the real purpose of that. The storm of protest was enormous. When I uh, learned that Nyang Ka Liu was visiting one of our laboratories at Leiden University, and the, the professor there said, oh, shall we do a little seminar with him? I said, well, let's do a symposium with him. And I can tell you that I had within two weeks all 12 major uh, players in, in ranking universities and an audience of 200 people from around the world coming to a seminar on global ranking. It tells you how emotional this thing was. And it is still very emotional. And lots of rankings are being designed and we all want to be ranked uh, universities, globally ranked universities. But you know, at the end of the day, it's far more about what we do than how that appears to the rest of the world. Global ranking actually doesn't, uh, uh, um, doesn't promote the development of diversity because we have a set of parameters and then we try and perform to these parameters in competition with everybody else in the world. And that creates a sameness rather than a diversity. And it's one measurement with multiple dimensions. So um, I've, I've been quoted as saying that ranking is an interesting game. And 
I think it should stay at that. It's not about the institution. Internationalization principally is about the students and staff of the institution. Now, if I look at your publication record, I find this. It's all teamwork. And in a knowledge-based economy, teamwork is, I think, one of the most basic activities to determine mankind's progress. Um, I can almost not imagine doing research on your own. It's always a team that tackles a particular problem. Let me give you an example. I just picked one of the papers um, out of your long list of papers from SITH. Um, I think this is a, a very important piece of work, looking at the creation of an anti-malarial um, and, and somehow enhancing the production of this. Um, it was a local collaboration between ITB and IPI in a decent journal. And I think it's, it's been cited once now. Let me show you another piece of work on um, a compound that has many industrial uses, levolinic acid. It's been cited 164 times. It was, and have a look at the yellow text at the bottom, um, University of Groningen, Parahyangan uh, in Bandung, and ITB. So here you have an international collaboration and um, it's been cited 164 times. Uh, a friend and colleague, Marek Kwik from uh, AMU in uh, Poznan in Poland has looked at the internationalization of research in Europe. And he did a quantitative study of 11 national systems in Europe. And there's two important um, conclusions from his work. International collaboration in all countries, in all clusters of academic fields studied, international collaboration research was strongly correlated with substantially higher research production. So international collaboration raises the research production. And more international collaborations tends to mean higher publishing rates. And those who do not collaborate internationally may be losing more than ever in terms of resources, prestige, and, and basically sort of slowly roll backwards against those who collaborate internationally. I found another interesting paper by Boti et al. And they looked at the impact of international collaboration. Now, this is the first thing you should notice is on the horizontal axis is the gain of the collaborator with a particular country, depending on which country you collaborate with. But look at that. The, the axis starts with, well, it's called minus 0.1, primarily, I think, for aesthetic purposes. Virtually nothing is less than zero. So everybody gains some impact from international collaboration. That's the first one, the collaborator. The collaborating country's own gain varies from or always a bit, 0.6 to 1.7. So in this quadrant, collaboration with Denmark yields the highest gain for the collaborator. This is the Netherlands here, here's Australia. Um, some of the countries that you collaborate with um, are sort of in this region. I'm trying to find Japan quickly, but I can't quite see it. The bigger the circle, incidentally, the more publications. So the US, for example, is quite big because it has a lot of people doing research. The UK a bit smaller. The impact of collaborating with the UK is better than collaborating with the US. Ah, I found Japan. Here it is. There is gain, but not as much as collaborating with some of these countries. 
So there, there is some patterns of international collaboration and how much you gain as a collaborator. Let me go to the next slide. Um, there is, of course, always some ranking. This comes out of a European ranking called U Multi Rank. And the, U, the, uh, the European Multi Rank, University Multi Rank, is not really like all the other rankings because it presents different aspects of university life quite separately. Interestingly, oh, by the way, you see here the Americas too. These are two universities in Latin America, not North America. So they're not US universities. But you can see Europe is very big on international collaboration. And in a way that's easy because where I sit today, if I travel 60 kilometers south, I'm in another country. If I travel 120 kilometers east, I'm also in another country. So international collaboration in Europe is relatively easy. Distances are small, roads are good. It takes me uh, an hour and a bit to be in, in Germany at another university. So that, that puts Europe in that sense at an advantage. But look how Asia also, Asian Collabor uh, universities are top performers in terms of international joint publications. Good. I looked at ITB, and I'm sorry I didn't have enough time to dig into SITH, uh, particularly also because it started in 2006 and before that it was something else. And it gets very hard for me to sort all that out. But this is an exercise that I would suggest you do as a part of your normal annual monitoring of how your research is going. But what I saw is this is at the university level, almost uh, 3,000 out of your 5,000 papers from ITB are collaborative papers. And a lot of them with, um, uh, um, of course, ITB sits here. You don't have to worry about that. That shows up. But Indonesian uh, Institute of, I think, is Science, University of Groningen, uh, I feel particularly pleased. We have a, a very, um, oh, what's happening here? We have a very good relationship with, with um, uh, ITB. But you can see here that there is quite a range. Now, this is very easy to do. Through Web of Science, you list all your publications with affiliation, uh, ITB, and then you take a look at um, either by country or by university. In fact, by country, it looks like this. Your collaboration from ITB, 23%, and this is SITH, I think, or at least in the, sorry, in the, um, uh, Clarivate areas, the, the web of science areas related to your faculty. Um, what you see, of course, all the papers have Indonesia's affiliation, but 23% of the papers with Japan. So it was interesting in your little video to have this Japanese professor uh, extol the virtues of his co collaboration with ITB. The USA, 14%, Australia, 10 the Netherlands, almost 10 and And the University of Groningen is a big part of that. So you can see with um, who you are collaborating. And this was in multidisciplinary sciences, pharmacology, pharmacy, biochemistry, and molecular biology. And, and I've just grabbed multidisciplinary sciences. But you can do it better because you know all the names of the people that publish from your institution, you just from your faculty, and you just tote them up. Why would you collaborate internationally? Well, uh, it may be that you want to uh, engage with other disciplines and uh, they may be more prominent in another country. Um, I certainly, when I had my molecular biology lab, sent students from time to time to labs in, uh, at Oxford or um, uh, places in the US to learn a particular technique or to be trained on using a certain apparatus and then come back by the machine and we have someone who can operate it straight away. So acquiring expertise beyond my group. That's 
probably in research one of the most powerful drivers for um, doing this. And uh, one anecdote uh, um, uh, that's sort of very important that sort of uh, makes it very clear. An Indian professor once published a paper on some um, polymerization work. And no one in the world who tried could repeat this particular piece of work. And well, the experiment was conducted at room temperature. To cut a long story short, when someone from the US went and visited this professor to look at his um, polymerization at room temperature, the lab was not air conditioned and the temperature in the lab was well above 30 degrees. So when they went back to the US and repeated the experiment at whatever it was, 32 or 35 degrees, of course it worked. So um, sometimes uh, international collaboration can solve something that is seemingly uh, difficult to solve. There are some rules about international collaboration. Why start it? If, if you can't um, create a win-win, if, if it's all about us gaining and the collaborator doesn't gain that much, then it's out of the kindness that they might do this. But quite often you can define a win-win for both sides to work together. And by doing that, uh, get a very fruitful uh, international research collaboration. I'll come back to this later, but consider the characteristics of your international collaborators. That's an important one, but I'll come back to that. It's very sensitive. Um, so, practical approach to establishing the relationship. It's, it's important to proactively pursue any collaborative opportunities and know what's in it for them. Uh, I would refer to this now as social initiative. It's better you actively seek out international collaboration and that you wait in case someone might contact you. So social initiative is important. Define the type of collaboration. Don't start a project that's going to take 10 years. Start with something short term and simple first, something that is quick and easy to carry out that results fairly quickly in a publication because that's already a win-win. Define the, the main goals and expected outcomes. Be very uh, definite about it. Who does what, when, uh, and, and make that the basis of your working together. This is important, a good personal relationship. And so uh, notwithstanding um, the corona pandemic and the opportunities now for me to today i'm lecturing in in indonesia um, in uh, a week's time i'm giving a talk in manipal in india but i don't have to leave my desk i can do it from my desk but um and and a, a colleague who is the global sales director of cisco the the computer uh, network people she says i work almost exclusively with global sales teams. But what I do is at the outset of creating such a team, we all come together and we meet face to face. There is something human about that, that you need to make it really work. Talk about dissemination. What are we gonna do? Are we gonna publish? Where are we going to publish? If there's any intellectual property potentially involved, you have to, at the outset, before you get there, have to talk about uh, those sort of things. What are the resources we need and that we have and that you might need? Avoid conflicts of interest, that's an obvious one. And this is another good one. At my own institution, we have a campus in Qatar. I can tell you um, research money in Qatar, the, the success percentage of applying for a grant in Qatar is many fold that of in the Netherlands. And there is a huge amount of money available. So I always kept saying to staff, if you have an interesting research project that you can do with your colleagues in Qatar, let them apply for the money in Qatar because it's easier to get. So that's an important sort of aspect of uh, research funding. 
Now, let me get into this collaboration and diversity. Um, Netflix, some years ago, uh, let me first tell you something about Netflix itself. As you know, Netflix is a streaming service and you can watch movies or TV series. And depending on what you have watched already, they offer you out of their collection suggestions what you might like to watch. And of course, this is not someone sitting behind a computer seeing what Robert Cullen has watched lately. And let's now offer him uh, what he might like to watch. It's an algorithm that they use. And they wanted to improve because it, it helps customer retention. If I keep getting movies that I find good in Netflix, then I'll stay a loyal customer. So they wanted to improve this, the predictive ability of this algorithm by 10%. So what they did, instead of doing the work themselves, they said, okay, whoever can improve our algorithm by more than 10%, we'll get a million dollars. Well, that's uh, an interesting prize. And more than 40,000 teams or individuals from 186 countries around the world entered the contest. And after about uh, a year of uh, uh, trying, there were three teams getting to 8.26%, 7.8%, 7.6%. Nobody got this million bucks. Then teams started to say, but hang on a minute. If we start to collaborate with other teams that have also scored really well, the diversity of thought from us and the other team may well push us beyond the 10%. And that's exactly what happened. Um, a team called Belcor Pragmatic Chaos, which was a merger of two teams, scored 10.9%. And the ensemble, a merger of three teams, scored 10.10% and, of course, collected their $1 million. So what happened here? These teams, they were teams to begin with, but they had a certain cognitive repertoire as a team. So a number of individuals, two or three individuals in that team, each contributed their cognitive repertoire to the effort the total cognitive diversity of the team was composed initially of these two or three people. When they expanded the group with teams that had independently worked on this problem and had very different thoughts about it, when they combined this, they achieved what um, uh, Scott Page calls a diversity bonus. And a diversity bonus is an extra good outcome from a team that's achieved due to the diversity of the team involved. Now, let me remind you, as a molecular biologist, I'm now supervising, co-supervising PhD students with teams of professors who come from a totally different discipline than I did. Uh, one of the fun things was one of the other professors um, with a name, and you'll know instantly that he's Sundanese, Ridwan Malana, um, at the University of Groningen, um, when I admitted amongst all these education experts that I was basically a molecular virologist, he says, oh, well, I started my life as a microbiologist, so I now feel I'm in the company of kindred spirits. But it's that diversity of thought that creates in teams a situation of a better performance. Diverse teams perform better. Um, okay, you, you heard you're going to get a lecture on internationalization and here I am talking about diversity. So let's make the connection for you. The learning outcomes as I've defined them of internationalization activities at the individual level, and that's distinct from the institutional or national level, uh, intercultural competence, the ability to interact with people from other cultures in an appropriate way, and this international awareness concept like global interconnectedness, sustainability, local activities that have global impacts, etc. Now, 
there are ways of measuring whether someone is interculturally competent. And there is about uh, 300 different tests. It's typical of psychologists to make a really good test then turn, turn it into a black box and say, I can measure whether you have this or are that or uh, what your inclinations are, but you have to pay for the test. And then there are companies that use that and they pay for the test and this is how to make money. So that's a bit annoying because you can't really find out what's going on. However, there is also academics who create tests. And one of these comes from the University of Groningen and it's called the Multicultural Personality Questionnaire. And it looks at five personality characteristics, namely cultural empathy, how do you empathize with the feelings and thoughts and behavior of culturally diverse individuals? Open-mindedness, an open and unprejudiced attitude towards cultural differences. Social initiative, in which you actively approach intercultural situations and show initiative in these interactions. Remember I said, rather than waiting for uh, international research collaboration to come to you, be socially active and hunt these out, find them by yourself. Emotional stability, if things get a bit tough to remain calm and flexibility, where a, a new situation you've never experienced before is seen as a positive challenge and you adapt to meet that challenge. Now, as I said, there's about 300 uh, tests of intercultural competence, ICC, uh, based on about 30 theoretical models. And of course, people review these things. Now the MPQ has come out well in a review in 2013, that's 13 years after it was created. And even this year it was reviewed and people said, yeah, it's good, but it misses out on being non-judgmental. I don't think so. Inquisitiveness, yeah, maybe. Cosmopolitanism and self-awareness. Now, let's go back to the MPQ, because it measured the ability to interact with culturally diverse individuals. Now, there is a short form of this test with 40 questions. And so I went in and had a look at the questions relating to cultural empathy. And here are the questions, and I've not written them out in full, but sympathizing with others, setting others at ease, enjoying other people's stories, paying attention to the emotion of others, is a good listener, enjoys getting to know others profoundly, notices when someone is in trouble, and senses when others get irritated. I see nothing here about culture. I see everything about the empathic trait. And so I started to think, and I've looked at other items in this test, there's almost nothing relating to culture and everything relating to diversity. And this is how I think internationalization and diversity are related. Internationalization is about dealing with one type of diversity, namely, cultural diversity. But in the world we live in, there are many other sources of diversity, professional experience, age, gender, socioeconomic background, the living environment, uh, rural life versus urban life, for example, the learning environment. And I could go on, there's an endless list. In our knowledge-based economy and the knowledge-based work that you do and that you are studying to become, all these different sources of diversity translate in part into what I would call a cognitive repertoire of an individual. How someone thinks, how they analyze things, what they know, that all makes up the cognitive repertoire of a person influenced by all these different things. Now, diverse teams perform better. Um, the diversity bonus. And Scott Page doesn't talk about cultural diversity. He talks, uh, look at these guys doing the Netflix challenge. 
Um, let me give you another example. Obesitas as a population health problem. 50 years ago, they would have told you, oh, this is something for doctors and nutritionists to sort out. If you see the people that occupy themselves with solving the population health problem of obesitas, it includes economists, it includes psychologists, physiologists, molecular biologists, the list goes on, it is endless. Many different disciplines have to come together to try and solve this particular problem. It's a very diverse team. Now, I said I would come back to rule two, um, considering the characteristics of international collaborators. Ask yourself these questions. Are they open-minded? Are they flexible, emotionally stable? Have they social initiative? What you're doing here actually is trying to discern whether they have characteristics that make them good at interacting with diverse individuals. How do you find out? Go and visit them or have them come and visit you. Meet them face to face. Take them to dinner. These are the things we do when we have an international collaboration, the tea room conversations. Um, and be prepared to be surprised. I took um, the rector and several professors of Leiden University once to China. And before we stepped on the plane, I asked this professor um, who was a specialist oncologist, I said, so what is your purpose of joining this trip to China? He said, well, he said, Robert, I work on a very rare bone tumor. And in the Netherlands, we only have 17 million people. So the number of cases I can study is not very big. But he said, China is a bit bigger than the Netherlands. It has uh, a few more citizens. And so it's likely that they have more cases of this rare bone tumor. So what I want to do is go to China, make some links. They can give me the samples and we'll do the tough work in the Netherlands, and that's how we will collaborate. When we got back on the plane, I said, and did you achieve your aim? Have you set up some collaboration and will you get samples? And he said to me, Robert, I will be extremely happy if they let me collaborate because not only do they have very many samples, but all of the technically difficult work they're doing here already. So he completely underestimated uh, uh, the, the uh, state of progress in this tumor uh, story in China. Cut a long story short, two Chinese postdocs six months later joined his laboratory and it's been a, a wonderful collaboration. So yourself, be open-minded, be flexible, don't be judgmental with whomever you collaborate. I've done in my time as a virologist work on viral diseases in Indonesia. And I've always gone in assuming them to be my valuable partners. It's not, oh, I'll come and teach you how to do this stuff. No, we're equals. And, and be non-judgmental and open-minded as you go into these things. So, Diverse teams, well, international, and, and, and I think I can demonstrate is relatively easy, even with your own data from SITH publications, international collaboration leads to uh, more published output and it gets noticed a bit more. That's how it is. Um, disciplinary diversity, and, and it was nice to see in your little video uh, at the, the outset, the combination of science and engineering embodied in biotechnology. Uh, and I think molecular biology has given us a common language to talk across all biological disciplines. Um, disciplinary diversity, however, and I mean true disciplinary diversity, leads to the most highly cited papers. Uzi and his co-workers looked at 17.8 million publications and found that the most highly cited papers were deeply rooted in a particular discipline, but the 
people publishing, there was always at least one, what we call outlier, one person not from that discipline. So when different disciplines meet, very interesting things happen. And that's what I meant with my little personal anecdote. When a molecular virologist started working with um, educational scientists, we get some remarkable insights. I lear I've learned an enormous amount from talking to these colleagues, but they assure me they've learned a lot from me with my somewhat naive view of education as a molecular biologist. So how is diversity and internationalization related? Internationalization deals with only one source of diversity, but diversity includes internationalization, but it has many more sources. And so when you want to get students to be internationally more capable as your dean sort of said at the outset, don't just focus on doing international things. That's my statement. It's a pity that international is part of internationalization, but let them work with diverse individuals, whatever the source of diversity. One of the, in my mind, excellent ideas about bachelor education in Indonesia is your community service period, where students with a lot of knowledge go and interact with the community somewhere and need to somehow apply their knowledge and their expertise to a community situation. All right, already the, the act of explaining what it is that should be happening or what you want to do to people who don't have the same background is reaching out to a diversity and bridging the gap. And those skills are incredibly important in later working with culturally different people or working with your colleagues from a totally different discipline. When I was doing my studies, uh, I was looking at doing a PhD in virology and they uh, say for the fact that I couldn't get a scholarship, um, I had arranged to go and do my PhD at Harvard with a virologist who I later discovered was actually came from the physical sciences and he's done some excellent work. Let me leave you with one last slide to explain this diversity concept and to pick something very important out of this. And it's the red square in the middle, task relevance. I'll do it by way of a little anecdote. When I first became director of internationalization at James Cook University, I too, um, fell into the trap thinking internationalization is the most important thing to add to the university work that we do. So everybody has to internationalize. Well, in some faculties, they'd roll out the red carpet when I came because they were really embracing internationalization. And in the faculty of engineering, for example, and figuratively speaking, this didn't happen for real, but it was almost like the dean quickly ringing around to all his staff saying, lock your doors, turn off your light, pretend you're not here because Kulin is coming and he wants us to internationalize. What I have learned in the last two years is an expression in English, horses for courses. You need to consider the relevance of the diversity that a challenge requires. We do it in the world of work. If you're solving a problem in your institution and you think, gee, I, I really need someone with experience in forestry, then you're not going to look in, in uh, uh, the Department of Ecology. No, you're going to look in the Department of Forestry for an expert who can help you. So when you've dimensioned the task, you say, I need these experts to come together to solve this problem. The other way around, when you're... Um, helping students to learn to embrace diversity. Let me give you a very simple example. If I have a course in international business and I have a cohort of students from all over the world, and I say, guys, you're gonna make teams to create a business plan of doing business with China. I'll bet you anything that 
every team will try and get at least one Chinese student in their team because they know China better than we do. And then we can create a better business plan. Let me do the same exercise in molecular biology. People go, oh, well, Indonesian, Chinese, Dutch, Bulgarian, what does it matter? Molecular biology doesn't have that, that task relevance in terms of cultural diversity. Now, that's a really important concept to consider. And mind you, children of six years of age and maybe younger are already capable of discovering characteristics that people may have to take advantage to achieve a task. Let me explain, because you've all had the experience. The teacher says, we're going to do sport. These are six-year-old kids. They've just joined the class. They don't know one another. Yeah, they have a few friends because they're in the same neighborhood. The teacher says, you and you, you must choose members of your team, one about. So first you, then you, then you again, then you. The first time they do this, they pick their friends or the popular kids in class. After three or four games of soccer, they go, I want you, I want you. They have a very definite order because I want a good goalkeeper, I want a good goal scorer, I want a good defender. They have discovered after a few games of soccer exactly what psychomotor abilities the different students have in class. Wow. No teacher ever says, hey, kids, let's sit down. How come? When we started and now, you know exactly who to pick to alert children to the benefits of recognizing diversity. That never happens. Oh, we had a great game of sport. You guys won, you lost or whatever. There's something else in there, pedagogically. Uh, Charlie always gets picked last because Charlie is a computer nerd and he really doesn't like sport and he's not very good at it. As a teacher, it's my obligation to make sure that I also make a class task where they work in groups to do with computers so that Charlie can shine and his self-confidence can grow stronger because now he's the top of the class with this particular skill. So the, the pedagogical challenge at the university level is actually to know your students. Now, this is a very different environment from just talking at students and giving them a lecture and saying, go away and learn it and come back and show me that you've learned it. This is the education where the differences of people are appreciated and people with particular talents get to apply these talents. I spent months trying to computerize my RNAs T1 mapping. What I should have done instead of working this out myself, go to the Department of Astronomy where they do nearest neighbor techniques like it's nobody's business, and they could have given me a program to do this computerization just like that. If only I had thought to go to astronomy. I thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you very much, Professor Robert. Very, very nice talk indeed. So <laughs> I completely agree with your uh, presentations actually with the diversity especially. Uh, we saw that our students uh, in in Indonesia, we have a national competition for um, students uh, from from university, right? So they have kind of um, they need to have creativity and something like that. Then uh, from our school, or for example, they also cooperate with the uh, students from uh, electrical engineering or from mechanical engineering, something like that, and it proves that the results are quite satisfying, I guess. So <laughs> I completely agree with your, <laughs> with your talks. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Roberts. So uh, I think I will open a uh, discussion now uh, for uh, several um, uh, uh, people, if they have something to uh, give or opinion or question or something like that. I think uh, Bu Enda, uh, please, if you would like to give your comments. Thanks. Thank you, Paindra. Uh, thank you, Professor Kulen, for the uh, presentation. Yeah, uh, it's th thanks for reminding us uh, that diversity is, is important, not merely uh, having collaborative work with international partners, but uh, broader perspective on biodiversity. I think as a biologist, we all agree that, but sometimes we are 
uh, we forgot how to apply that in in another type of world. If we are uh, uh, talking about uh, ecosystem managing ecosystem, we remember that. But then sometimes for other other type of activity, uh, uh, either we we forgot or we don't know how to deal with it because uh, managing diverse people with diverse background uh, it's it's quite challenging and sometimes myself as a teacher not patient enough if i i have to run a class in that kind of mode but yeah but i i i'm agree that this is important uh, uh my question is uh, about your uh, uh early part of the talk that you mentioned about the ranking yeah i completely agree that it's not everything but yeah uh unfortunately <laughs> uh, our world is uh pushed by that kind of thing uh including in indonesia uh including itp uh, if our rank uh, lower a bit a lot of stakeholders start to <laughs> complain <laughs> complain about that but yeah uh but uh, but we uh, we also feel that uh, having international collaboration is important, and I would like to uh, ask your suggestion. Uh, at the moment, we have uh, quite a numbers of young uh, faculty members. Yeah, uh, some of faculty members, although they graduated overseas, but when they uh, uh, go back to went back to Indonesia, they have to adjust their uh, direction of research uh, according to the availability of facility and availability of opportunity in Indonesia, because probably mm -hmm. during their PhD, they have to fit into the, their supervisor research agenda. But in Indonesia, they, they have to create their own uh, research track. And it that means some of them have to uh, 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 change uh, direction same subject. So uh, it may not be closely related to their former university and former supervisor. So they have to seek another new partner. And uh, some, sometimes it's not quite easy. Uh, you have listed some of the tips here uh, before. Uh, could, could you pinpoint uh, what would be the most important if, if, if someone have to search their potential partner from the scratch, like from Googling, things like that, yeah. would, would someone, would our young staff uh, better try to approach the senior, senior or uh, the researcher at, the, at their same age? Uh, could you give some suggestion in yeah. this aspect? Thank you. Um, first of all, I think, um, when they have to change direction, um, they need to become familiar with the literature of this change direction. Like who are the movers and shakers in this field? That's step one. You can't get around that. Yeah. Then you have to think about if I were to collaborate outside of Indonesia or inside of Indonesia with these people, what can I bring that would augment their work so what mm. have i got to offer now apart from youthful enthusiasm and more creativity when you're younger um, i think you need to be a little bit strategic about that part and um, who do you ask do you ask young younger people do you ask older people it depends on what's required in the way of resources See, if it's a very costly collaboration, yeah, the younger people in laboratories, unfortunately, don't have um, the sway that the more senior people have about a particular collaboration. And yet, I think in terms of flexibility and creativity, the younger people will be easier to move. Mm. So my strategy, if I was in your position, would be to write to the senior person in the lab saying, could I discuss some ideas with one of your uh, uh, younger staff? Okay. 
So you generate enthusiasm and that younger staff becomes your agent to set up the collaboration. And uh, in, in most situations, if uh, one of my research assistants says, oh, you know, uh, so-and-so from that lab wrote to me and wants to look at things together, I'd always say, yeah, go ahead. Look at what you can do. So that's, of course, and, and, and I think we should, as seniors, be convinced that okay. these sort of uh, broad collaborations uh, can only have merit. Okay that joining of, of forces. So it's, and I understand differences from culture to culture about the power distance. Oh, can I write to the professor of this big research group? In most, certainly in most um, Western countries, but increasingly throughout the world, the seniors are worldwide and don't have this feeling like, oh, how dare you write to me, you little pipsqueak. Quite the opposite. And people usually warmly embrace mm -hmm. the younger persons approaching them and saying, would you mind if, or can you point me to someone in your group who has time to work with me? So that's the sort of approach okay. I would okay. advocate. Right. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Roberts and Glenda. Okay, uh, anybody else wants to ask uh, to Professor Robert? Please raise your hand or you can type also in the chat. Um, many things that are very interesting uh, to us actually. Okay. Um, no, yeah, there is one, Professor Robert. I will. Uh, well, I um, it. Why don't you <laughs> directly oh, ask to Professor it. Robert? Is it okay, Waan? Yes, uh, right. so uh, uh, anyway, I did it. Uh, Professor Robert, thank you very much for your inspiring talk. Um, I have two questions for you. Uh, the first one, um, I want to ask your opinion. Uh, actually, uh, as, uh, actually, I experienced the uh, work in a team uh, with the multidiscipline uh, research, and I know that I learned a lot from my colleagues from a very different uh, field of study. And also uh, I can have, a, as you said, an open-minded and also to see uh, my field in a different perspective. However, I think in terms of uh, publication, uh, it's a bit uh difficult when you have uh, so many or not too many uh well few peoples with different uh aspect and then you have to write a paper so it takes a longer time actually so what is your um opinion or do you have any suggestion how to cope this pl uh, problem especially with the uh, uh paper writing a paper mm. Okay, and then, can I continue to my yeah. second uh, let question? Me, no, let me answer this. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. Okay. That's a bit easier. <laughs> um, I, I point back to the paper by Uzi et al. in Science, mm -hmm. um, where they showed that um, the outlier, so the different discipline coming together with a deeply rooted sort of uh, uh, paper, that the outlier makes it more highly cited paper. Mm. I agree with you that um, it is difficult to work with people and, and come together and, and write one paper. Let me tell you, one of my colleagues did a PhD and looked at the collaboration between people in pedagogy, people mm -hmm. in a discipline, and people who were expert at internationalization. The first thing that happens, and so I didn't detect it in your statement, the first thing that happens is mutual distrust. <laughs> what do you know about my discipline? What do you know about internationalization? What do you know about education? Instead of what I hear you say is, wow, I can learn from you. I know nothing about internationalization, but now that we have you there, students in my institution where we allow them to work on real world problems, mm -hmm. they can uh, 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 register for that problem 
irrespective of their year of study or their discipline. And these students at the end, when they have the final product, they say, wow, I was so happy to have students from information technology as part of the team. So we didn't have to learn the basics of that discipline. They all agree that it takes a bit more time to create the product because you have to consider all these different opinions. Mm -hmm. But considering them thoroughly from your perspective and having the discussion. Mm -hmm. See, um, in a team, if everybody simply nods yes, and, and mind you, this used to happen a lot in academia. The dean says, we must all go left. And everybody goes, yes. Mm -hmm. Ma'am, yes, sir, we we'll all go left. These days, if a rector of a university in the Netherlands say we all go left, then 50% of the people say out of principle, okay, then I go right. <laughs> and the other 50% sort of might just have a bit of a debate, is left or right better? Mm -hmm. So, but in a team, the best idea, if everybody simply nods yes, if one person opens their mouth, the idea is as good as what the best person in that team can produce. However, if there is a good debate and discussion, that takes time, but a good debate and discussion, the team get the, the idea gets better mm -hmm. because it's being considered from multiple perspectives. So, yes, I agree with you. It's harder to write the paper. I'll guarantee you the paper will be better. Okay, thank you. The second question. Okay, the second one is uh, regarding the World University Ranking, about the ranking. Okay. Mm. So, well, this um, about the ranking is always, I think, there is a pros and a cons. Uh, and many people, they don't, uh, uh, don't realize uh, until now, even in ITB, what is the benefit uh, of us, for us? to have a certain rank, okay? that's the first one. And then the second one, as um, in this situation, in this condition, uh, ITB has a, a rank of 303 for KS, okay? and above 1,000 for THE. And so what I'm going to ask you uh, is, we are, uh, we are urged to have a collaboration with a higher rank university. Of course, it is uh, easy when we have a lot of uh, faculty members, which is alumni from a good university before. But if it's not, how to start that collaboration? Because I think for the collaboration, we'll start always individually and always with trust. Mm. So do you have any uh, suggestion or tips for us? Thank you. Let me start with the benefit of having a certain rank. You know, one of the effects of what Nyang Kaliu did with creating ARU was that universities that weren't ranked, mm -hmm. even in the top 1,000, started thinking up other forms of ranking mm -hmm. and look for something where mm -hmm. oh, we're ranked really well. The, I understand the reality of ranking, and it's the politicians, of course, and <laughs> the people with their hands on the money that... Yeah. have a very limited view of ranking. Mm -hmm. um, I can remember a friend of mine, uh, Jamal Salmi, he was the World Bank Director for Tertiary Education, was in Malaysia when the second ARU came out. And mm -hmm. the University of Malaya had dropped mm -hmm. from their position about 100 places. Mm -hmm. The politicians yelled for the rector to be <laughs> fired. Now, you and I know that in one year, the research at a university cannot sort of crash mm -hmm. like this ranking would suggest. And because Jamal was there, he explained to the politicians, <laughs> oh, don't fire the rector. They've changed the methodology of the ranking and more universities have participated. The research last year and this year at the University of Malaya is still of the same quality. So mm -hmm. the, I understand the political pressure. The only way to deal with this is for the rectors collectively to go back to the politicians who hold the money and say, hey, guys, this ranking is really a bit silly. Mm. And see, ITB, in, I'll, I'll guarantee you, if we do ranking of universities in Jatinango, mm -hmm. I know who will be at the top, guaranteed, in every discipline. So mm. 
ranking is the parameters you choose. Mm -hmm. Now, there are also commercial mm -hmm. companies like Quackerelli Simons mm -hmm. who say, okay, um, yeah, you're not ranked, but we have a star system, just like the mm -hmm. hotels, a one star to a five star. So mm -hmm. we can come and examine you. It costs you money, but then we'll give you a five star rating for, you know, whatever you might have a five star rating for in their system. And let me tell you, it's very easy to achieve a five star mm -hmm. rating for something. And then you can put on your website, we're five star mm -hmm. Quackerelli Simons mm -hmm. ranked on this topic. Mm -hmm. There is a bit of silliness in it. And the benefit of having a certain rank only extends to your political environment. Mm -hmm. um, in some countries, they say, and, and I have one PhD uh, candidate looking at this right now in Latin America, and he's studying the PhD scholarship systems. <laughs> and he says, in some systems, they say to students, you must select an Aru top 500 university mm -hmm. to do your studies. Yes, yes. This is a very, silly, you know, yeah, this happens. This is a very silly way to go mm. because, in one particular field, in a small subsection of that, there may be some absolutely brilliant work going on at a totally mm -hmm. non ranked university, but is the top of the world. And let me tell you, my home institution, the people that pay my salary, now the University of Groningen, get me for free. So, uh, uh, another institution, NHL Standard, pays my money. <laughs> they have a program for training teachers for international schools. Around the world, the top ranked universities when it comes to education say the golden standard mm -hmm. for this program is at NHL Standard University of Applied Sciences. And so Hong Kong Education University wants to collaborate with us on a joint program. Now, Hong Kong, in terms of ranking in education, is one of the top ranked universities in the world. The University of British Columbia, the guys in education said, oh, we want to work with these guys. We want to work together, except that their senior management, huh? you want to work with the University of Applied Science? Go away. They're not ranked. So... It's a very um, uh, silly way of deciding who you will work together with. It is much better if you start looking at the publication profiles or the specific need you may have. So it needs to be content driven. Now, I accept the reality. They say, please go and collaborate with top ranked universities. You then need to, and this is in my tips for international collaboration, what can we offer that this laboratory in this top-ranked university might want? Let's say they're in a temperate climate. You have a tropical climate. Now, in the biology already, you know, my bell start to ring. Oh, that leads to interesting situations. So you may be able to offer an environment and the way to address some topic in that environment with all the equipment you have and the resources and the quality of the people doing the work that is for them very difficult to achieve because each time they want to do this they need to travel to a tropical country so you need to start banking on what have we got and and this is an exercise i think that's worthwhile for the faculty to actually do and say what are our unique selling propositions in terms of the fields we cover. Once you have those, you can start to then very strategically go down that path and say, so with whom could we collaborate who are interested in this and our USPs make us an interesting partner. This is not a quickie exercise on the back of an envelope. You need to <laughs> analyze this carefully and, and structurally and strategically, and then very tactically show a social initiative and reach mm -hmm. out. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see you're working on this. And, and um, you've said in, your, in the end of your paper, yeah, there's still some more work to be done. And um, I see that that work could be more easily done in my environment. You have another advantage. Mm -hmm. And I've, uh, uh, when I was at Leiden University, I managed to create one such situation. <laughs> I'll tell you what the advantage is. 
Um, your salaries mm -hmm. compared to, say, European salaries are quite different. Very different. They're very different. <laughs> so what I managed at Leiden University was with uh, UGM, yeah. mm -hmm. I said to a research group at Leiden University, if you spend the money you would spend on a part-time research assistant on a full professor at UGM, then you actually have a very senior person who can, with whom you can collaborate. Mm -hmm. And mind you, from a content point of view, this made sense. Then someone said to me, yeah, okay, it'd be nice. Or, or a PhD student who leaves, you continue to fund them, to give them research funds, to be able to continue the collaboration. There's a few models there. They said, but what if this professor just gets students to do the work? I said, wonderful. You have an even larger group for the same money doing all this interesting research work. So because of the salary difference, that offers an interesting USP. It's only a salary difference. I always say, take a million people anywhere in the world, you have the same brain power. Mm -hmm. And that's a biological fact. We can't get around that. Yeah? The only difference between one million and another million is mm -hmm. the chance to be educated. That's no problem in Indonesia. So yeah, work on your USPs. And sometimes they are in corners that you didn't expect, like the salary difference. Mm -hmm. get a piece of research done will be cheaper mm -hmm. at ITB than it will be at the University of Groningen mm -hmm. as simple as that okay thank you so much uh, Robert okay. for your very inspiring uh, explanation <laughs> you gave me lots of tips All right. <laughs> okay thank you so much Thank you, uh, thank you, uh, Professor Robert. So, uh, yes, uh, a lot of uh, <laughs> questions <laughs> regarding this internationalization and also university rank. Uh, I think I will give opportunity to students uh, if you want to ask to Professor Robert, because this is really rare opportunity yeah, to uh, especially maybe to ask about how to get a um, competitive um, uh, scholarships, for example, from international, or uh, how to uh, improve your ability to get the uh, opportunity to have um, exchange students, for example. Please ask to Professor Robert. Any... And by the way, if, if they feel unable to ask questions now, I've just put my email in the chat. Feel free to email me anytime. Wow, <laughs> that's very I nice. have no problems with um, answering questions in emails because I know at the heat of the moment you may not have a question and then you walk away and think, oh I should have asked him this or that <laughs> send me an email yes thank you very much Professor Roberts that's uh, very kind of you uh, yeah I think we need someone like you that can speak to our uh, house of parliaments people <laughs> there <laughs> to <laughs> be change the <laughs> As soon as I can travel to Indonesia, I'd be happy to. Um, <laughs> All right. I, I used to I used to regularly uh, visit your Ministry of Higher Education. Ah, that's perfect. Uh, yeah, maybe uh, I, I know people there, and I'm perfectly happy with them to to debate things with them. Oh, so, <laughs> my pleasure. <That'd> be nice. <laughs> All right. Uh, any other questions uh, before we end this uh, session? Uh, Bureni, please, Bureni. Thank you, Pa Indra. Thank you, Professor Robert. Uh, uh, I agree with you that uh, meeting up is one way uh, to get to know our uh, partner to be. And uh, any any suggestion during this pandemic when meeting up is uh, not possible and the only way for us to get to know our uh, partner is by uh, meeting up via zoom or other online uh, platform uh, I mean uh, we, we cannot get the chemistry you know when we we 
eat together, when we drink together, uh, we, we can get the chemistry. How can we replace uh, that part? So that's my first question. And my second question, uh, there, there was a time when we got wrong on our first impression uh, of one of our collaborators. And uh, once uh, we start our collaboration and we found out that uh, one uh, of us is uh, not possible to follow, for example, our speed. We need uh, to have a certain speed to deliver whatever we have uh, the goals. And uh, what we uh, did was uh, we took over his or her a uh, task. Uh, the only reason is we get the work done. That, that's it. Uh, do you think that's the right thing to do? Uh, or have you got any suggestion? Thank you, Professor Robert. Okay. Um, as a molecular virologist <laughs> uh, uh, with uh, more than a passing interest in the evolution of viruses, um, and I've, I've uh, I'm, I still communicate with some colleague virologists about this to think about how, how do they think this is going to go, uh, including um, my old PhD supervisor um, who still heads WHO teams uh, also in relation to this particular pandemic. This is a temporary problem. Um, it's temporary in a sense that for a collaboration, see, collaborations are not something of five minutes or half a year or even one year. If you're going to do international collaborations, you want to set them up for the longer term. And yes, I said start with a small project first, absolutely, uh, before you expand to a longer term collaboration. Um, you cannot do any better than what we're doing now. I mean, I'm giving this talk here now and that's made possible by the internet. And it's wonderful that we can do this. Unfortunately, as, as you correctly um, said, you can't develop, you, you miss a lot of signals that we are barely aware of as humans that have to do with body language and, and all sorts of things that you can't convey through the internet. You have to think about it as a long, longer term uh, project that's going to survive this corona pandemic. Um, at the moment in the Netherlands at universities, we don't do social distancing anymore. We don't wear masks. Lecture rooms can be filled with as many students as we like. And this is a very carefully considered move that has to do with we don't want to fill up our hospitals. We have a very high vaccination level. The lowest are in the younger people. And there is now the Delta variant, which very easily goes around society and is easily transmitted. So they're all problems. And despite that, a team of uh, epidemiological experts, virologists, immunologists have said, hey guys, we can afford now to just open uh, universities the way they used to work. So that tells you that when Indonesia gets to a certain level in terms of vaccination, you will also be able to go back to how you do things. So this is temporary. Yeah. The other uh, ray of hope I can offer you is that from my understanding of the RNA biology, uh, RNA copying is very sloppy. As it happens, this virus has a correction function in the polymerase, which means um, it's a little less sloppy, but it's still sloppy. So new variants occur all the time. The variant that does best is the variant that makes us the least sick and is transmissible the most easy. And it's a game of chance, which mutation is required to create a variant that doesn't cause much disease. So it must be a poor replicator gives you a cold. When you have a cold, do you stay home? No, you, you go to work, you uh, swallow some deco, deco gain and you continue. <laughs> yeah. you know, whilst you do that, you, you're infecting your colleagues and they all get a cold and they all swallow deco gain and everybody keeps going. Uh, 
<laughs> when you get corona at the moment, you get 40% don't get sick at all. And amongst the 60%, there are people who get very sick. Well, when you're very sick, you lie in your bed. You're not transmitting the virus as much. So um, the, the general thought is that slowly this virus, some variant will arise that will take over the world because it causes little disease and it's highly transmissible. And, and at that point, this thing, we have six coronaviruses that cause the common cold. There's little doubt in my mind that they may have started as nasty as this one. But of course, that was in historic times and people wouldn't have even known they had this virus. People just dropped dead because they have difficulty breathing. So two rays of hope. One is international collaborations will outlast this pandemic. And I think the pandemic will also by itself abate over time. Now, wrong first impressions, that can always happen. It's not very common. So whilst you should be open-minded and flexible, start carefully. And if you do get into a situation where someone is not able to perform according to what you agreed would happen, be flexible. Be flexible. And, and step over that problem by compensating in one way or another. And maybe that person comes on stream in some other aspect of your collaboration. So I always think um, this is for the longer term, things don't always go or often don't go as you planned. None of my PhD students finished their PhD the way they thought they would when they first started, none of them. They all come across some situation where they say, I have to change course. The pandemic caused my PhD students to have to change course. Students who were looking at um, group dynamics of collaborating learning groups composed of multiple nationalities, all of a sudden they went online. So what did we do? We said, okay, do the online situation. Once they all go back to meeting one another on campus, compare online with group dynamics on site. And so we've, from a, a problem, we've made a benefit. All right. Thank you, Professor Cullen. My pleasure. All right, all right. <laughs> okay, very nice. Uh, Professor Robert said you give all the answers for all the questions actually. And uh, if we have more time, uh, actually we want you to stay here for a couple of hours, but unfortunately uh, the time's up. So uh, thank you very much for your inspiring talks. And of course, if the pandemic ends, then uh, we show that we want to invite you in person uh, to uh, ITB <laughs> as a collaborator, yeah. and of course. <laughs> and <laughs> uh, thank you for Bufeni as well that are um, inviting you to to give a, a nice nice presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Roberts, once again. And for the students, if you have any questions or uh, our uh, colleagues as well. Um, Professor Roberts uh, kindly uh, write it down his email uh, at r.j.colon at rock.nl. Thank you very much. I give it back to uh, Bufeni. Thank you very much and big applause to Professor Roberts. Thank you very much to our guest lecture, moderator, audience for very good, this interesting discussion this afternoon. Yeah, luar biasa, Prof. Robert. Prof. Robert uh, can speak Indonesian juga loh, ibu-ibu, ibu bapak ya, dan teman-teman. Lumayan, lumayan, Pak. Lumayan. <laughs> your batik is very nice. I like your batik. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Prof. Thank you. Robert, uh, uh, Prof. Robert, as a token from us for sharing your wisdom to Indonesian academic community, we have a little gift from SCTH, which will be given by Ibu Endah. Okay, thank you, Bu Feni. Prof. Robert, this is only a a small token of appreciation uh, uh, that we can uh, deliver to you virtually. <laughs> Thank you very much. So fully you can accept that. Thank you. Okay. Uh, maybe uh, we can take a picture of, of all of us uh, for admin, please. 
uh, organize it before we, we finish the session. Group photo. Yes, group photo. Okay, I will take a picture of us. Uh, if you don't mind to open your uh, video. Students. Hello, Melita. How are you? <laughs> Melita is here. Ada okay. Pak Adi. Yeah, that's Pak Adi as well. Okay, we start to take a picture. Uh, there's uh, five frames. Okay, the first one. Uh, maybe we can put um, C for Cullen for the name of the uh, professor Cullen. <laughs> <laughs> That would be nice. Thank you. One, two, three. Okay, the second frame. There's a lot of students. The third frame. Four and five. Okay, we finished to take a picture. Thank you very much for all of audience uh, for your participation. We are looking forward to see you at the other STTH lecture or webinar series. Stay healthy and safe. Thank you very much, Professor Robert, Pro, uh, Pak Indra, Bu Enda, Bu Aang, Bu Reni, dan Bapak Ibu semua, teman-teman juga. Sehat-sehat uh, semua ya. Selamat sore, selamat siang, selamat pagi di Netherlands, Prof. Kulen. Thank you. Terima kasih, Terima kasih Bu Tati udah rain. Sampai ketemu lagi. Sampai ketemu lagi in person. Yes. Yes.